Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today and many thanks to you, Erica, more ways than one. And to you, Mustafa, uh, for inviting me to Ozit. Lovely to see my friends, Terry, Helen. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope I don't disappoint. Okay, so of course, as you heard, I've got a, a sort of a varied background. So I'm going to come to translation studies from a health professional and health interpreter educator perspective. And so to do that, I'm gonna um, give you a little bit of history about um, myself. I noticed that Sandra Hale did this at the OZIT conference a few years ago, and it was absolutely lovely actually, um, just to know a little bit about the child she used to be um, before she came to Australia and Argentina. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about factors impacting on health literacy. And there's a lot of barriers to accessing health information. And written texts can be very, very scary to people. We don't realise that because we love them and we love reading and writing, but that doesn't go for everyone. It's very important to bear that in mind. And then the important role of community translation and how that's aligned with health literacy. My perspective on community translation and health literacy, which is why I'm going to give you a bit of background about myself, and what is just enough? Because a lot of medical professionals think that they need to let us know all the details. That is in their mindset, and several people focused on that or touched on that yesterday. They want to give you all the details with very complex um, language and very complex imagery, and I've chosen some examples um, just to give you a bit of a laugh, but in fact, it's very hard for them to imagine um, any other way of presenting things because they're so worried about leaving things out. And then I'll end up with the need for collaboration. In an ideal world, we actually co-design health information for community translation for different communities in collaboration with the people who write the material, the translators. Um, you will hear me also mention interpreters as <coughs> intercultural experts and the end users of the translation. Okay, so New Zealand. New Zealand is pretty diverse at the moment probably catering for up to 200 different community languages. And um, you heard Erica mention the cervical cancer inquiry. That had been a huge research project that went on for years and years and years, where a professor thought that initial changes in the cells in the cervical um, wall wouldn't always lead to cervical cancer. And he wanted to test that the normal way, where you have a control group and a, test, uh, a group that is treated normally and a test group. The test group were not treated, they were just followed up. So the inevitable happened and many women developed cervical cancer and they were again just followed to see what would happen. Um, there was no informed consent and interpreters were not used. This led to a large government inquiry led by Dame Sylvia Cartwright and one of her recommendations was we always need informed consent and that must and we always have to use trained health interpreters where practicable. And then the very first health interpreter training course was set up at what was then Auckland Technical Institute. We had 13 different languages in the class, I think 17 students, and I was one of the students. They had to sort of drag me into that because I said, I'm already a registered nurse and I'm, I've already got a master's in translation studies. I don't need to be here. But it was actually a very useful, um, useful experience because the, the introduction to interpreting, um, note-taking, interpreter role and ethics but I thought the health interpreting part was particularly poorly taught. And I said that to the lady uh, involved, Sabina Fenton, and she said, OK, you can teach it next year. And I said, great, thank you. <laughs> and I did. So I started teaching healthcare interpreting just three hours per week during the 90s while I was working as a registered nurse. And it was during one of those classes that I actually got the idea for writing um, a guide to health healthcare interpreting for people that haven't got a clue about how the body works. And that was me before I did nursing training. I had no idea how the kidneys actually work and how water actually gets there. No idea at all. So um, that's what I still do. So I've, had, I've got about 30 years of um, teaching health literacy basically to interpreters and translators. Um, as you can see, the most commonly used languages for in, um, interpreting and translation services are uh, there, you can see some Chinese languages, still a big need for Samoan, Tongan. Um, some people have been in New Zealand for maybe 
possibly 30, 40 years, but they just have always worked in manual jobs and they have never really developed very good proficiency in English. And then of course, medical English is a completely different um, point altogether. And we get um, refugees and the quota is going to be increased in July next year. So that the demand for the la for languages for community translation changes all the time. But there is some constants, Mandarin, Cantonese, Samoan, Tongan and Korean. Um, okay, so we uh, in New Zealand have had non-language specific interpreter and translator education since the late 1980s. And I've developed some um, pedagogies to try and make sure that people do get feedback, but this is not the place to talk about that. But if you're interested, you can talk to me about that later. So yesterday we heard Professor Katan, Katan, um, he's um, name fluid on that point, talk about <coughs> cultural competencies for community translators. Sorry, David. <laughs> I thought that was a very lovely point about the name fluidity. <coughs> and why not? So, you've heard several speakers yesterday talk about the social function of community translation and how important this actually is to make sure that members of migrant refugee communities have equal access to information that they need. And that particularly goes for information on health and also on legal information, tenancy tribunals, disputes tribunals, um, how the courts work, um, police information. And um, you heard Wei Tang yesterday, if you were here for his presentation. Well, Wei Tang and Joanna Byrne and I have also published on community translation in New Zealand of police information and health information <coughs> and pragmatic equivalence. Our written texts always the most effective. They are for us. We're probably those people that collect pamphlets, I don't know about you, or go on the internet and we look up lots and lots of information as much as possible because we have the literacy and the foundational knowledge required to be able to do that and to benefit from that. But there are people who find text frightening. I remember we were talking about soccer. My boys um, and now young men, they used to play soccer and they had a coach who um, asked my husband to be assistant coach and there was a good reason for this. He was very frightened by any pamphlet that had more than two lines of text on it. And so he actually admitted to us, he was a native speaker of English, he was functionally illiterate. There's a lot of people out there and they're hugely embarrassed by it. And a lot of refugee people, a lot of refugee background migrants refugees have very poor literacy in their home language. Very often, like if you look at people from Burma, their home language wasn't the language they were taught in that school or they were not able to go to school because they had to flee and they spent years and years in camps. So we cannot take it for granted that people are literate in their home language. I think that's a very good thing to bear in mind. So. We need to do a needs assessment of the target community. Find out what it is that they want to know. As, as we heard yesterday, very often it's people in government, in health, in the courts that decide, well, this is the information we're going to put out, can you translate it? Not an ideal situation. All right, so I'm going to talk about that as well. Our preconceptions about what people need may be incorrect. Um, one example is my ex-student, um, Hoi Neng Wong Soon. She is Chinese Samoan, very, very literate person. Her mother developed diabetes and then the complications of diabetes and Hoi Neng had to be her main caregiver and deal with her um, CAPD, which is peritoneal dialysis. Now, at Middlemore Hospital, which is a fantastic hospital, um, it has a very good burns unit, which has some patients, I think, from the um, volcano eruption at the moment. Really, they're in very good hands there. They decided to give her oral information on how to do the peritoneal dialysis because she's Samoan. And Samoans, this is the preconception, have an oral tradition. She was so annoyed. She said, I want stuff in writing. So I went on the internet and I looked up everything I could found, find. 
So we have preconceptions about people from communities. We forget everybody is a unique individual and so we need to check with people what do you want and in what form do you want the information. So there's a whole range of considerations. So is the information culturally appropriate? Are the pictures culturally appropriate? Mammogram pamphlets with a woman standing side on with a bad breast in the machine. Ooh, that puts off a lot of different people in a lot of different communities. So that may not be a good idea. I know I'm from the Netherlands, pretty much anything is acceptable. It's on television, it's in your face. I'm very much aware that there's a lot of different um, communities who just shiver when they see that sort of thing. So we need to be aware of that. And of course, culture affects so many things. A lot of unspoken beliefs and expectations, and because they're unspoken, and we've grown up with them, we take them for granted. What are acceptable topics? Um, pre on, for instance, I'm, I've got a funding application going about assisted reproductive technology. Well, the whole process involves some things and some topics that are tapu or taboo for Pacific Island people and for people from a Polynesian background. So how do we present that information? Because they do, they, there is some things they need to do that it will lead to the expected outcome, but if we can't really mention them it, or have images there, then it becomes quite difficult. The way we interact with people, and Wei Tang touched on that yesterday, in a very authoritative manner, or as in New Zealand and Australia, very consultative. The length of sentences. I thought that I was uh, pretty good when I, I teach all my students to have no sentences longer than 13 words. I went to the Netherlands re recently and they said, no, no, no more than seven words. Okay? So I thought, well, that's going to be pretty difficult. <coughs> okay. And what happens to health information pamphlets? Deborah Barmer, in her PhD thesis, she looked at the health literacy and health information environment in New Zealand hospitals, particularly in the Waikato region. And she checked the bins by the hospital entrance, exit, whatever you want to call it, same door, and they were full of health information pamphlets. That was like getting a dagger through the heart, I tell you. I, I was so upset when I heard that, but yet, if that's the reality, then we need to be aware of that. Do we have community translation? Or do we insist that people who've been there for a while have to learn the language of the country? And unfortunately, and I'm really embarrassed about this, in my home country, um, so they decided in 2012 that migrants no longer had a right to health interpreter services. Mind you, they don't have health interpreter <laughs> training as far as I can see. Universities feel it's not academic enough as a topic, interpreter training. <laughs> don't get me started on that. Okay, so there's a drive to write simple Dutch, but simple Dutch, if people don't know how the body works, it may work for Dutch people, but does it work for migrants? I don't know. So I'm going to present some work in this presentation that's done by FAROS, which is the Centre for Overcoming Health Inequities, and in, in they are in Utrecht. They do a lot of tremendously good work. It's not translated, and so people in other countries, unfortunately, are not aware of it, but I hope that after today you can see the sort of work that they do, which is amazing. Um, and Paola Gentile wrote about the, um, the situation with interpreter provision in the Netherlands at the moment which I also don't want to get started on because I won't stop. It's um, quite horrible. And um, yes, Yamashita wrote about how difficult it actually is for people to write or to read information in, in other languages. So we, we shouldn't assume anything. Ah, that works. So I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of information on how, who I am and how I got to be who I am today. And so that's just in, in very brief. I wanted to be an interpreter, but um, there was no interpreter training in the Netherlands, so I did translation studies at the University of Amsterdam. And that's a picture I painted of Browns Bay, which is a very beautiful village, beach, um, on the north shore of Auckland, where I live. And you can see it's a bit cartoony. Right, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm now a painter, but I'm still a cartoony, cartoonist sort of a painter. Okay, so that's, I think you recognise that child on the scooter. I always had high levels of energy, 
and so I scooted around a lot. Um, but I also had a, a huge interest in foreign languages and I, I was born in a tiny village. My father was a policeman. We moved from tiny village to tiny village, so this was village number three. Um, I'm in front of the house where we live, which was a tiny house and it housed the police station. And um, so my father um, had his office, which was I think three by three square meters, <coughs> very tiny. And as a young child, probably about five or six there, I had a very big interest in knowing what, sorry, I'm going to mention the P-O-O -O word now, so if you are sensitive to that, stop your ears. I, I would say to my older sister, I wonder what poo is in French. I wonder what poo is in German. I wonder what poo is in English. I wonder what poo is in Portuguese, because for some reason, the doctor of the village had gone to Portugal and I realized, oh, there's another language and it's called Portuguese. I was very interested in that. And so as a surprise gift on the 5th of December, St. Nicholas, he must have overheard me, he gave me a chocolate toilet with a chocolate poo in it. And I've never forgotten that. Okay, um, so as a seven-year-old, I asked my mum to teach me English. As an eight-year-old, I asked the neighbour, we'd moved again, to teach me Frisian, which is very similar to Old English. And then I went to school with Indonesian-speaking children, and I went home and said, they speak Indonesian, I want to learn this language. And my dad said, oh, no problem, I have a book, because he was also nutty about language learning. So I learned Bahasa Indonesia, just so I could know what the other kids were saying. Then I was very lucky. Um, for high school, I went to a gymnasium. Nothing to do with sports. I'm not a sporty person. But I able to learn Latin, Greek, French, German, English. And then I taught myself Italian and Biblical Hebrew. Very difficult. Lots of tense aspects. Um, the Greek turned out to be very useful later when I did nursing because I was able to do all the multiple choice tests without knowing the answers just by looking at the Greek words. And I started writing political, uh, doing political cartoons, which were published in one of the national newspapers. Then I went to the University of Amsterdam because I wanted to be an interpreter, but you could only do that particular course of studies in Belgium or in Switzerland, and my parents were not rich. And education in the Netherlands was almost completely free. You could go to different universities, still the case today and study as many papers as you want, many courses as you want, for the same low fee. And at that time it was 200 guilders per year. And when, by the time I finished it was 600 guilders. So I was very, very lucky and I'm very much aware of that. <clears throat> so I studied translation studies. English to Dutch was literary translation. Dutch to English was community translation or technical translation. And they said, you should really all have an area of specialty. So later on, it made no sense whatsoever. I know I did a whole nursing course and <laughs> became a registered nurse. The best thing I've ever done. Um, yeah, and we were actually we were made to read all the German translation theorists in the original, of course, being in the Netherlands, we were expected to read that in German. Um, so, and that was a very big influence on me. And then I went to the St. Lucas General Hospital and trained to be a registered nurse. And I was Turkish speaking patients and Arabic-speaking patients, and so I bought a book and taught myself Turkish so I could interact in Turkish. And I tell you what, that made a huge difference. My Turkish was no doubt extremely poor, but it, it just made interacting with people so much easier. And because I think you show respect if you try and interact in someone's language. After traveling through Asia for almost a year, um, working and living in Hong Kong, backpacking through China for four months, that is a huge experience in terms of feeling so powerless because you can't read anything, you don't even know where the restaurants are. Um, I arrived in New Zealand and they said, well, you can't teach English because you're not a native speaker. Okay. I thought, well, I know what it's like to learn other languages, so I should be the best person to teach English, but never mind. And, but I, I did get involved in teaching health interpreting <coughs> on a very, very part-time basis as I said, about three to six hours a week. And so I worked as a nurse at Middlemore, night shifts. That was a huge learning curve, burns unit, intensive care. And I learned a lot. It's a very English culture. I kept saying that to people there, this culture is so English. Epaulets on a uniform? Are you joking? What is this, the army? 
Um, in the Netherlands, it was like, you know, as long as it's white and clean and you can't wear it on your way to the hospital, you must get changed in the hospital and then change out. No way are you going to sit on the bus in your nurse's uniform. So there's a lot of cultural things, I thought. <clears throat> Worked a lot at National Women's Hospital with very ill ladies with preeclampsia, which is a very serious condition, and worked for the Southern Cross <coughs> Healthcare Line, giving health information. So again, information to literate people, because they were all Southern Cross members, it's a private society, that had high levels of literacy. But I loved explaining and unpacking very complex things. And I wrote the first um, version of that book that you see there, Asked by Students. Okay, again, later I was very, very, very lucky to be given a Fulbright New Zealand Scholar Award in Public Health and went to Seattle Children's Hospital in the States um, where they have a huge population of limited English professions parents and the kids there are very, very ill. There's a lot of Spanish-speaking parents from a huge range of different countries. Spanish is usually their second language. Because they have Spanish surnames, the assumption is that Spanish must be their first language. It's not. An indigenous language of South America will often be their first language. And then they'll be illiterate and innumerate. So they can't read a thermometer. Well, neither can I if it's in Fahrenheit, to be honest. And so if a child has leukemia, which is very often the case, they need a bone marrow transplant and then the parents need to keep an eye on the temperature because they spike temperature they need to ring the hospital so they need to read the phone number and then ask for the interpreting service and it's that's impossible to do if you don't speak the language it's very very difficult so they've employed bilingual patient navigators <coughs> and those people sometimes work with families for six months before the families even trust them you have to remember some of these people are undocumented they have a huge distrust they have been traumatized on their way to the United States. So they had Spanish and Somali patient navigators. I think they've now added Chinese and Russian. That was a hugely interesting experience. And the center I ended up in was called the Center for um, Health Equity, Diversity and Health Equity. And I loved that concept, a center with that name, just to address health inequities. So health literacy, is, there is huge numbers of low literate and low health literate people in every country. It's over 50% and it's very hard for us to understand that. There's a lot of literature on that. And of course, there is a huge link between low health literacy and poor health outcomes. So people with poor understanding of how the body works, and I'll give you some examples of that later, um, they don't understand why they should take medication. For instance, you're told you've got diabetes and it's very serious and you need to take your medication. You take your medication and you feel no different or you think, oh, well, that's it, I'm better now, and you stop taking the medication. But of course, you're not better. You have to keep taking the medication. Or you're told you're sick, you've got diabetes, so you need to stick to this diet and you can't eat jasmine rice because jasmine rice is not very good. It's actually worse for you than sugar. A, you don't want to hear that because you love jasmine rice. It's so fragrant and tastes beautiful. But B, you also don't understand why that sugar is bad or why your insulin levels will go up if you eat a lot of sugar and why insulin is bad for your blood vessels and why that causes problems at every level of the, every cell in your body. You don't understand any of that. So why would you do this? And the third thing is, why would you start exercising? You've just been told you're sick. So that doesn't make sense. Exercising, I'm sick and you want me to start going to a gym and running around? It doesn't make any sense at all. So these messages are not going to be heard. They're not going to be followed. They're not going to be complied with. <coughs> um, low literate migrants, you have them here. We have them in New Zealand. Um, Mele Tupal Gordon and I wrote about Tongan Health in New Zealand, which is amazing, where Tongan health professionals, Tongan doctors, Tongan nurses, Tongan social workers, Tongan podiatrists, Tongan dietitians work with Tongan people. And because they work, they are language, they're offering language and culture concordant care, Tongan people tell them what's wrong with them. 
The Tongan nurses also go to markets, like very popular markets. They sit at a stall, they talk to each other in Tongan, and Tongan people that walk past, they say, oh, are you Tongan? I'm Tongan too. They sit down and then the nurses say, can I take your blood pressure? Do you want to take your shoes off? Let me check your feet. Because very often with diabetes, of course, you get very poor blood supply to the feet and they may have mottled feet and very poor circulation. And so this is how they actually do outreach. Unpaid, by the way. It's just out of love for their community. Works really well. Um, low literate refugees. Um, Shrestha, Jagmaya Shrestha, she works at AUT, the same university I met. She's a registered nurse. She's from Nepal. And it turns out that Bhutanese refugees resettled in New Zealand speak uh, her language. So she's done a lot of work on needs assessment and on empowering communities to actually help themselves. It's, a, it's very important work. And um, a lot of the time their children have been used as interpreters to convey important information on health literacy. And then of course we forget that deaf people um, were only mainstreamed very late in the game. I'm not sure about Australia, but certainly in New Zealand. And so a lot of people my age and older are very, very low literate in English. And finger spelling or get it, giving them pamphlets to read is actually not going to have any sort of effect. It doesn't work. So I think that we all agree on the important role of trying to get that health information in a language that the community can understand. So community translation, but how? Well, I mentioned the Center for Diversity and um, Health Equity at Seattle Children's Hospital. And they had a lot of people doing outreach work with African communities, First Nations, and um, the bilingual patient navigators, as I said, they empowered families, That's, that, that was their role, they, to empower families to understand what was wrong with that child so they would understand what the treatment plan was and actually be able to ask questions of the doctors. They identified barriers because it turned out sometimes there was, I think there was a mother and her child had a very serious skin infection and she had to bathe him in an antibiotic solution four times a day. But she didn't dare tell the doctor that she was actually homeless. It has so easily become homeless in the United States. I was completely shocked. Um, spoke to lots of homeless people there because I also helped out at the homeless camp where they had dental, um, dental clinic, mobile dental clinic. Very, very easy. So that's a huge barrier. And she felt very embarrassed, so she didn't want to tell the doctor. She told the navigator. The navigator said, can I tell the doctor? And so then they sort of, they gave her a bucket and said, maybe go to a public toilet area and fill the bucket and put the solution in there. And they also tried to help her find a roof over her head. So there's huge barriers that people are often embarrassed and they don't want to tell us about, just like they don't want to tell us they can't read. They don't want to tell us they don't know that there's actually a brain in here or how the body works. And barriers to access, a lot of the Spanish speakers would work in the blueberry industry across the mountains from Seattle, huge distances. I know Australia is big, the United States <laughs> are big too, and Washington state is a big state. So they'd have to travel five hours to even get to the hospital. And the navigators used stories to convey messages. And one story was, that I'd like to share with you was about a navigator who was working with a genetics counsellor and a couple who had already had a number of children with very severe genetic problem. And they had to see the genetic counsellor because they wanted, the genetic counsellor was trying to tell them where children come from, they had no idea. And rather than going, and she kept going into the complicated story of, you know, conception, and the navigator said to the counsellor, may I suggest a different way? Why don't you talk about making a stew? Because they'll get that. So mum and dad are making a stew. Mum keeps putting in the same ingredients. Dad keeps putting in the same ingredients. And the stew keeps turning out the same way. So they did that. I would have thought it was, would have been insulting because, you know, you're comparing my child to a stew. But no, they got it. They actually understood that's, um, that's why we keep having children with the same problem. 
So it was a narrative that worked. And not all the information was there. But the crux of what the Genetics Council was trying to bring across was conveyed. Another thing I saw at the Seattle Children's Hospital, so SCHS Seattle Children's Hospital, were talking cards to convey discharge information. That's a huge issue for hospitals. Um, when I came back from my Fulbright stint and went to Middlemore Hospital, because it's a hospital of huge diversity in a very, um, it's got some people from very poor socioeconomic areas, very deprived, very low health outcomes. Um, they said to me, they were interested in patient navigators and they said, we do everything really well, except discharge. Discharge, goes like this. Mr. Tybee is in his bed. He's just had some complicated procedures. The doctor comes with all the junior doctors. Hello, Mr. Tybee, how are you feeling today? Okay, and Mustafa says, I'm fine, thank you. And well, you're okay to go home now. Here's a letter for your GP, and that's it. And the letter for the GP is written for another medical professional. And even if you translate it, it's not readily comprehensible. So they said, we do everything well except discharge instructions. The same went for Seattle Children's Hospital. So they used, um, they had a small project which was um, done by Ali Adem. He is um, a Somali, he was a Somali patient navigator. He's now in the UK. And he interpreted for 10 Somali speaking families when their child was discharged. And that was recorded onto this card. So this is what it looks like. You can order them online, I have to warn you. Um, I've used them, and I'll tell you, talk, you about, talk about that as well. And a lot of them were actually not working for some reason or other, so that was a, a big setback, I thought. But anyway, he was lucky. Most of his cards worked. I think nine out of 10 worked for him. And so the different discharge instructions were recorded onto the card. So you just press the record button, and unlock it, press the record button, and then they could go home and press the play button and listen to it again in Somali. So specific to them. I thought, well, that's great. I can use this in New Zealand. But at that time, our faculty had no research funding whatsoever. And in fact, um, last year, 40 full-time staff were made redundant. So that was the ultimate outcome of not having any money. Um, so there was no money. So I thought, okay, I'll have to think of a way that's rather <coughs> low cost. Um, people at a in dialogue conference in Europe where I was two weeks ago, they laughed at this because there's a lot of European money apparently, or European Union money, difficult to get, but um, there's quite a lot of euros, but you just have to make do. So I thought, okay, what is a huge problem in New Zealand? It's diabetes. I think it is around the world. And where can we stop people from developing a propensity to have diabetes later, it's when we address diabetes during pregnancy by having normal blood sugar levels. So I thought, okay, what I could do is approach um, people at the National, at the Auckland City Hospital. Um, and so I spoke to Dr. Janet Rowan, she's a diabetes physician at Auckland City Hospital. And she said, oh, that's brilliant because we always have interpreters and this is the information. Um, I will write it in a shorter form for you about gestational diabetes, that's pregnancy diabetes. And there's two choices for the women. They can take metformin, that's an oral um, medication, or they can inject themselves with insulin. And so she says, I'll have a bit of information about metformin, pros and cons, insulin, pros and cons. So I thought, brilliant. So that was translated into Chinese and then recorded onto these cards in Mandarin, Cantonese, and Samoan. The Samoan women that went to the specialty gestational diabetes clinic, they didn't take any cards home at all. They were not interested. They just wanted to hear it from the midwife. And I have to say that was probably just as well because the Samoan version, Samoan is rather what I call a long language, and it was almost like Hoi Nang recorded it and it was almost like she was speaking at a gallop. So it was, you know, you would have to really pause it all the time. The Cantonese information fitted onto one card, all three passages onto one card. For Mandarin, I had to have three cards. One, what is, what is gestational diabetes? 
one what is metformin and one what is insulin. And the only uptake was amongst Chinese speaking women, Mandarin and Cantonese. Then Chinese um, speaking, Cantonese and Mandarin speaking research assistants ran, rang the women and got their feedback. So, and they said, yeah, that's great. And we went on Chinese internet um, and we went on Weibo and WeChat to talk to other women and learn more about diabetes. But really what we want is to know how to manage this. So these were again, literate women. They understood the information, but to them it was not what they really needed. See, again, I should have done a needs assessment first rather than me thinking, okay, this is what women need. This is how I'll do it. Didn't work. Plus some of the cards were defective, which was very, um, yeah, very disappointing. And um, Hoi Neng Wong Soon and her Master of Health Science, she interviewed Samoan women, three generations, and they found that actually personal interaction with the midwife about portion control and exercise in a community setting was what actually really helped them in terms of pregnancy diabetes. So again, very interesting. So this is just um, a little bit of information on the talking counts. I've already given you most of this. So it was handed out by midwives. And then the midwives asked women for consent to get their, have their mobile phone numbers shared with us so that we could contact them afterwards. So that helped to some extent. This sort of information, you can see it's baffling, right? I find it baffling too, don't worry. Probably maybe slightly less baffling than uh, most lay people, but still TNF alpha resistant. Oh yes, leptin. Okay, we will, won't go there. So yeah, the uptake, as I said, was low. And I thought at the end of that, I thought, well, I probably need to have a different approach now based on what these women said. I need to look at what they should eat, probably with photos and then put it on the public website. So I went to another hospital spoke to the midwives there, that was interesting, still in Auckland, and they said, oh no, we're not going to give that information, that is way too complex, we just have pictures with words, and I said, okay, well we can do the translation and the voiceover, but I got so bogged down that I never actually got down to that, but it's a good idea if you want to take it up. <coughs> so I think pictures of plates, you can see there's protein and vegetables, I can't see any rice there. No noodles either because uh, I think women get to a stage where they really should just really cut the carbs almost completely okay and if you want to look up um, the glycemic index of jasmine rice the University of Sydney does some really good work and I don't think they are impeded by the rice industry because the rice industry doesn't want us to know that jasmine rice has got such a high glycemic index and by the way that means that your blood sugar level just jumps up very sharply. Then your body releases insulin to make sure that the sugar can go into your cells and the high insulin levels and the insulin peaks are what's damaging to your blood vessels. So you don't want that. You want to keep your blood sugar level steady and not big jumps like that. I know this is bad news for all those who love jasmine rice. I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, another example the minister, I looked at the Ministry of Health focus because this time I thought I'd better be strategic and see if there's any funding. So what does the Ministry of Health focus on? They focus on people living with long-term conditions, as was mentioned yesterday as well by Abigail, and um, non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease. It's not, you can't catch it off someone. High blood pressure, not catchy either. Okay, so things like that. Chronic pain and then the elderly, and the elderly often have problems understanding um, information about medication and side effects, or they don't want to know. I remember my auntie saying, I never read my blood pressure medication side effects because I don't want to know. And my father saying to her, I read it all repeated, repetitively because I want to know what to be aware of so I can catch the first signs and go and see the GP. So completely different attitudes, so that also plays a role. Okay, so two groups particularly at risk. 
um, are those amongst the elderly who have trouble processing information, maybe due to a lack of completed formal schooling, and also older health consumers who have limited English proficiency. Um, we have different approach, of course, in translation studies, product-oriented, process-oriented, and reception studies. And so I'm actually using a bit of all those. I'm always quite a flexible person rather than a very rigid person. I think that everything's got something that I can learn from. So the, the final product, the process of getting there, but also input from the end users. And so what I decided to do was talk to a community pharmacist. Sorry, this is, I'll come back to this later if you want. But um, who should write health information? I'm constantly trying to tell people, women, that there is a huge link between breast cancer and alcohol intake. Women don't want to hear this. <laughs> so I go into the details. Maybe this picture would be better. Um, and you see, you can see some real medical language there. And showing them that doesn't help either because they just like a glass of wine to relax at the end of the day. So I'm giving, I'm giving up those efforts. Okay. So my recommended approach was um, a little bit like what Montalt and García Izquierdo and García Izquierdo and Montalt Resurrección, I hope my pronunciation was acceptable, um, have done when they wanted to develop information sheets on chemotherapy for cancer patients in Spain. They decided to involve the end users, so the women. Is this information understandable? And um, is this what you want? Is there anything missing? Is it clear? So my approach would be to ask registered nurses to write the, in, no, sorry, back to the beginning, ask the end users what they want first. Then get a registered nurse to write the material. Why? because they are used to explaining things in everyday terms and also to getting immediate feedback from consumers so they can ask questions. Whereas doctors usually go... Any questions? Okay, maybe I'm just... I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, intentionally um, ridiculous here. Um, of course, doctors are all different and some really take the time to explain. And then ask experienced health interpreters and translators for their input. Why health interpreters? Because again, they are there with the consumer. As interpreters, we do our translation. We think it's a good job. We send it off, but we don't see the response. Health interpreters see the immediate response from people. And I find that they are often very much aware of what works and what doesn't. Um, because they're there and they work with people on a day, daily basis. Um, consult target readers on the appropriateness of the text, the ease of understanding, the naturalness of language, too little or too much information. If the language isn't natural, people switch off, which is also what Wei Tang found. Um, if I get a manual about my new iPhone and, it's, and the English is really odd, I actually don't tend to carry on reading. I just put it to one side and think, oh my goodness, they should have put a bit more time into that. And I would say consider the use of audiovisual. So very simple, not too much information because what studies have found is that if you have a lot of information in your pictures, people start focusing on the earrings the lady in the picture is wearing or her shoes or maybe on the cup on the table rather than on the message. So I think I've got a stick figure, which is what Pack and Save in New Zealand use for their ads, um, probably works rather well. And I've got a little link there so you can see the pack and save ads. They're very, very effective because it's just the stick man and, he, and there's a voiceover and he walks around and he, he gives you the message. And I always remember those ads, but I don't remember the ones that have been, had a lot of money spent on actors, etc. So you see here, this is picture number seven of antibiotics for children. So always give it until it's finished. So the bottle, you can see the bottle is empty now. There's the measuring cup, 15 mils, and that's the sickly pink antibiotic liquid that um, children are asked to drink. 
And then maybe once you've done the text, it's been translated, it's been voiced over, and you've had the pictures tested, and you've had people's input, does this work, is this culturally appropriate, then make sure that you can send it to their, fast, to their smartphones. Because there's been research in Australia, oh sorry, New Zealand, about Pacific people they don't have computers at home, they tend not to have laptops or computers, they all have smartphones. And what also really works is have a little bit of music playing very softly in the background. Not loud enough so that you can't hear the text, but just very softly. Just makes people feel very happy and welcome, and when people are happy they take in information better. Um, for my research project, I'm using Clawtrix, so I've got uh, pictures that I'm going to show to you and the information I'm presenting on is on beta blockers. Um, beta blockers very commonly prescribed for people with cardiovascular problems particularly very high blood pressure just reduces the load on the heart and the heart becomes less sensitive to stress. Ah, five minutes yep good and so it's a very important medication and very poorly understood and people often stop taking it. When they stop taking it suddenly, as you pointed out yesterday, Abigail, it can just lead to heart attacks. So it's very serious. Okay, so as I told you, I love cartoons. So this is, of course is Snowy or Milou or Bobby in the Dutch version. I think in South Africa it's called Spoky, which means little ghost. And I took um, this from, I'm not sure if this is the right version now, so I'm going to go and play this little clip um, on psychosis. What is it? Explained in Moroccan Arabic and created by Faros in the Netherlands. Psychosis is very difficult to understand, so I think these people have done a great job. There's Dutch subtitles for you who don't understand Arabic. And I think that's very helpful, don't you? Okay. Hariba. Shnu gadi tqadr al-aila dialu dialu bash ta'awnu. Hada huwa Ismail ma'a al-walid dialu al-walida khu wa khutu. Okay, that's lovely, but I'm going to cut it short there. Sorry. I'll send you the clip and then you can see it. Okay. So you see my father made me aware of this. He died this year at almost 92. He was always very supportive in sending me clippings from newspapers about ideas that he thought I could use for my research, which was so sweet of him. So he made me aware of this. And I thought that is amazing. So I developed two stories, one about Mr. Lee, who became Mr. Sione, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Patel. And he's prescribed beta blockers. And then I consulted a community pharmacist and she said, oh, that's great. This is what needs to go in the story. And I then drafted the cartoons thinking that somebody more proficient in drawing would do the um, professional um, version, but that never happened because um, I ran out of money. So short narrative, talked to the Pharmacy Guild of New Zealand and they said, oh, no, you can't say that if people stop taking beta blockers, they'll get a heart attack. And I thought, why not? <laughs> but they said, no, if you put that in there, you have to take that out because we won't give you access to community pharmacies if you put that in there. So that was a very interesting learning curve for me. Um, so we had the pictures, little narrative about Mr. Lee who goes to the pharmacist um, to get a script and the pharmacist says, do you understand what this is for? And he says, no. And then the pharmacist explains and he says, you, may, you have to keep taking this and you will keep on feeling well. And after a few months, your doctor may ring you and say, how are you going? And she may change your dosage. Okay. And then at the end of that, there is some questions, some multiple choice questions. So beta blockers are for, and then there's some answers. So that make it very easy for us to pick the correct answers in call tricks. And that'll then, all those responses will be sent to us. Okay, so this is my, this is one of my drawings for Tommy, who's taking antibiotics. So here we have Mr. Lee, Mr. Sione, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Patel. So as you can see, this was just a, draw, a, a draft drawing that was voiced over in different languages that was done at our studio at, in my faculty, very professionally, and incorporated into the prototype app. 
Here's Mr. Lee, Hassan, Sione, Patel looking quite unsure. And he's now feeling better because he's taking the beta blockers. And he's waiting a few months and then the doctor rings him to see how things are going. So just very simple pictures. Okay. And at the moment, it's the last thing I'll talk about is I've got a funding application in with the Health Research Council of New Zealand. It's about an assisted reproductive technology. It's really complicated procedures. You've got GIFT, ZIFT and IVF. Um, there's a very clear picture there with very clear words like OO sites instead of eggs. Um, yes. Pre-warmed Petri dish. A Petri dish, most people don't have that in their kitchen cupboard either. And they're very complicated instructions. So I've asked for, I think it's $160,000 to be able to do several different podcasts in English and Samoan and Tongan those languages. There's information in Chinese on fertility associate websites. So hopefully um, we will get that money. And another thing I think is a good way of getting information across is what depression.org.nz do. They have people telling their stories. Erfahrungsdeskundige, that's a Dutch word and it means patients who have been through depression, anxiety, and have managed to cope with things. I think that really speaks to people. I use those clips, they're in English, I use them for interpreting practice, um, for my interpreting students, but it would be really good if we could have those sorts of stories in different languages. I know that's not community translation, but it's people's stories, so just different languages. Maybe blurring faces if people feel um, a stigma. So, my perspective is it's important to use stories rather than that information the way it's always been presented so far. The way we understand it, but it may not work for everyone. So who should write it? Who should review it? Um, focus discussion groups? Or if you have a podcast, let's get people to have a look at it and give their feedback. Who should be consulted? Again, I've put that third, it should come first. So there needs to be a needs assessment with the community first. What do you want information on? I asked the Samoan community and they said gout. I asked lots of different Samoans, they all said gout. Not diabetes, gout, because it's painful. Okay, swallowed a word there. Okay, and then the importance of key messages. So don't overwhelm people, don't throw all that medical information over them like a bucket that you're emptying out. But just the key messages, what do you really want to achieve? And it's usually compliance with treatment. So what do you want them to understand so that they'll comply with treatment? What do they think they want to know? Don't give the people too much if you know, they're not medical doctors. And I'm not in favour of keeping people stupid, but I'm very aware, having worked with people who are very low literate, of when it, there comes a point when people say to me, stop, my head is full, okay? Stop there, that's, that's enough, that's all I want to know for today. And then I just respect that. And the importance of images, but what types of images and why? We need to think about all those things. So, interpreters are actually very good um, to involve as, at the first stage as intercultural experts. And also to use when you are uh, holding a focused discussion group. One minute. Ah, oh, I'm doing really well because I'm on my last slide. Okay, and then check how the translation is received, the voiceover, how that's received by the end users. I did check the Samoan translation of the spoken card, the voiceover, with a group of Samoan women who were training to be bilingual navigators. They sat there and they were very, very quiet. This was the slow version, by the way, not that <laughs> version. And so I thought, mm, I don't know what's going on here. So I said, so what do you think? And one of them said, it's so beautiful. And I didn't know it could be said so simply because this woman is using informal Samoan. She's not using, there's three levels of Samoan, more formal and then you've got chiefly Samoan. And she can speak chiefly Samoan, but she used informal everyday Samoan. Not talking down to people, but at the level that they were used to using every day. And they loved it. So again, I checked that and got their feedback. 
And then if you have a podcast or anything, incorporate multiple choice questions using Qualtrics so you can actually easily see how things were received and what people thought. And if it's an app and it's on the market, well then you can automatically get ratings. So you don't need to worry too much about Qualtrics. But I use Qualtrics because I want to get answers to those multi-choice questions and it's a bit difficult with an app, as far as I know. So. I think we've got time for a question.